Hi, good afternoon. Welcome all to join our third CPAC CME. I am Yen Fong, Head of IBD Business from Genscript. I'm very proud to present this CME in collaboration with Thomson Wells. This webinar will take about 45 minutes and we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A session. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Many doctors already sent in questions through emails. You can also type in your questions in the chat box and we will answer them um, during the Q&A session. We see increase of fully vaccinated populations and many countries choose to live with COVID. Despite full vaccine regimen, many breakthrough COVID cases still occur. Is there a way to predict the risk of breakthrough infection in an individual? Has the vaccine worked in me? Does the vaccine continue to protect me? Is my vaccine protecting me from the emerging variant? So these are the many questions that doctors and patients themselves ask. Neutralizing antibodies are critical human immune defense mechanisms against viral infection, as neutralizing antibodies can bind to sites on the virus and inhibit entry of that virus into the host. Today, we have the honor of with us two of my most admired experts on the matters of infectious diseases, Dr. Leon Hongnan and Prof. Wang Lin Fa, to discuss about challenges in COVID-19 management, post-vaccine neutralizing antibody evaluation and protection against the new variant. As our tradition, we'll start the presentation with Dr. Leon. Dr. Leon Hongnan is an infectious disease specialist from Dolphy Clinic. Dr. Leong is well thought opinion leader of various of infectious disease matters, including COVID-19 management. He has been frequently interviewed on live TV, radio, newspaper, journals, and social media platforms. Dr. Leong has prepared an exciting talk to share his knowledge on COVID-19 management, the differences amongst existing serology tests, binding versus neutralizing antibodies, and how the CPAS use case from his own practice. Now, without further ado, we will welcome Dr. Leon. Dr. Leon, over to you. Hi. Hi. Okay. Uh, okay. Here, here I am, and you see, I, I'm just a seat warmer. You see the real. Okay. The, do I? See? Yes. I'm. Okay. I'm just a seat warmer. The real person is Grand Slam Professor Wang. Okay, that's the that's the key word. Grand Slam Professor Wang. Okay, uh, I'm I have a bias. Professor Wang and I are very very good friends, so we chat very frequently. Uh, and I'm just going to seat warm, and I'm going to share with you uh, some of the updates and discussions about the serology and stuff. Uh, I'm going to string this screen here. Okay, so the. Um, we're going to touch on a few things uh, from the serology testing, neutralizing antibodies, how it works briefly. Many people are asking me, what's the difference between CPAS and the regular antibody test which we asked for? So I'm going to touch a little bit about that. I'm going to try to talk a little bit about booster vaccines and why we're doing it, what's the evidence for it, and how do you mix and what do you mix? And if something happens magical magical when an infected person gets vaccinated. Now I'm going to share that with you because I know many, many people are not infected. I want to encourage you to get those people who have not been vaccinated to get vaccinated. If they end up infected, they must get vaccinated. And I'm going to show you some data which I have, but of course these are just very skewed data. They are not published data. Okay, so what's the difference between the regular antibodies as well as the neutralizing antibodies? Well, we measure different kinds of antibodies. They are all the same, but the functionally, are they the same? They are not. This is a spike protein, as you can see it, and antibodies will bind to it at different places. But one particular one, or a few particular ones, are very special because it will be mechanically obstructing the ACE2 receptor, which you have to bind there. So when actually mechanically blocks, it's literally forming a barrier in the uh, uh, in the spike protein joining the receptor and effectively blocks the virus of entering to the cell. So that becomes a neutralizing antibody because the virus cannot enter the cell, you effectively block the virus. So if you actually look at the old um, uh, definition of the antibody serology test, we'll be looking at the reds as well as the black ones joined up together. So if the Roche, Abbott, Siemens, they would have the reds and the black ones added up together. But if you actually look at the CPAS, you're only measuring the black ones. How much of the virus can you block effectively? 
So you can imagine a plate now, a plate that's full with 110,000 receptors, for example, how many of them have been blocked? If you have a blockage of 98%, then 98% of all the receptors were prevented from getting binding with the spike protein. So that's a measure of how well it is. Hence, it is not a, quantif what a quantifiable number like 2,500 or 5,000, but it tells you the number of percentage that is, uh, uh, that is blocked off. Boosting, I'm going to share with you a couple of slides. The main data for boosting comes from actually Israel. As you can see, among the different age groups from 60 to 59, 40 to 49, 39 to 16 to 20, we actually have a cut down and reduction in infections. This is for the prevention of infection. Now, if you were, if you're following the news, USA says they're going to only boost the 65 years old and above because they're only interested in death and mortality data. We are interested in cutting down hospital base requirement, the hospitalization numbers. We want to cut down infections. And in such, we want to blow it down. We do boostings at 30 years old and above. And that's the, per that's the difference between the US data, uh, what US is doing and what Singaporeans, uh, Singaporeans are doing. If you look at the, not, uh, this is in terms of prevention of severe disease between the non-booster and booster group. You have a reduction for 957 to 150, 160 to 70. The denominators is a little bit different. So what we do is we look at the rate ratio comparison. You actually have very good data saying that 40 years old and above, you have a reduction in severe cases from 18 to 22 times. This data comes from Israel. As you can see, it's from the Israel Ministry of Health. It is published in a preprint, as you can see it. Risk reduction helps a lot. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about boosting. Boosting, you may have come across a few terms. I want to share these terms with you. Homologous uh, boosting, that means it's exactly the same vaccine. So it will be Pfizer, Pfizer, Pfizer. Heterologous boosting, it means something different. So it could be Pfizer, Pfizer, Moderna, Pfizer, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, or AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, where there's a change in it. So technically, you can also talk about uh, Pfizer, Pfizer with an inactivated vaccine as well. That's heterologous boosting. So you also have heard about hybrid boosting, hybrid where you have an infection followed by vaccine. Just as a sidetrack, hybrid boosting is not new. And you have probably seen it in the dengue vaccine, which you have. It works best in people who have been infected before. Infection plus vaccine, you actually mount a very good immune response. Now, this is a very, very key, important paper. It's been accepted. I'm going to show you the, uh, the, uh, the, the results from this heterologous boosting. It's a bit complicated. Bear with me as we try, try to take you through the graphs. It compares between AstraZeneca, the AD26 COVID-2S, compares against Moderna, which are mRNA-1273, as well as the Pfizer, which is the BNT1262P2. Now, very complicated graph. Look at the follow me as I'm going to take you through. Antibody S uh, is on the upper, uh, the upper uh, roll of the slides which you have, and the bottom is neutralizing antibodies. So this is a measure of how much antibodies are produced after the vaccination. Then you realize at the top in gray, you have the primary series. So the primary series was the adenovirus 26, there's the AstraZeneca, mRNA will be the uh, Moderna followed by the Pfizer BioNTech. So in this group, the first column which you have here, these are people had the Moderna boost. So you can imagine the AD26 followed by Moderna boost, Moderna uh, priming followed by Moderna boost and the Pfizer priming followed by uh, Moderna boost. What are the results? You can see immediately that the boosting is actually quite good, quite reasonable. But if you look at it, perhaps the Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech might be doing a little bit better, but Moderna boost seems to be very, very good. This is the AZAC boost. And immediately you see that the titles which are obtaining compared to the previous ones with the Moderna boost all the lines are much lower, which means that the boosting antibody levels are much lower. But the mRNAs do better down here. Still comparison 
uh, to the adenovirus down here. So having a good priming vaccine, like the mRNAs do very, very well. So here's a Pfizer BioNTech uh, boost, AstraZeneca to Pfizer BioNTech, quite good. Moderna, quite good. And the Pfizer, Pfizer, Pfizer is still quite good. So if a summary for all these would now be, I'm going to present to you the summary of all of this. If you do an AZAC and you go on with an AZAC boost, your antibody levels are not very good. If you were to do a Moderna boost uh, after mRNA of uh, BioNTech, it's very, very good. I'm going to focus on the Moderna and Pfizer with a Moderna boost is excellent. Now, if you look at it the other way now, if you do a Pfizer boost with the mRNA, it's actually quite good. You can possibly argue that the levels are a little bit lower, but I think it's fine. I think it's good enough. Uh, we are just trying to split hands. So coming back, the summary slide is this, the AZAC boost, boost to AZAC is not very good. You do a Moderna boost for the, both the mRNAs, it's actually quite good. If you do a Pfizer boost or mRNA, it's actually good too. So the key point, the key message is that if I want to do any boosting, the mRNA vaccine boosting is actually the best. Are we surprised that we have gone into this sort of boosting where we change vaccines? Well, no, not really. Because in Canada, they first started out the Pfizer-Moderna mix because they were short of vaccines. Then Canada went on to do the AstraZeneca to Moderna uh, so as to overcome the clot issues and Germany did the same thing as well. And this gave us an opportunity to look at this alternative boosting. When you change over, do you get something better? I'm going to show this to you. This is a publication done by the Swedish uh, people where they talk about heterologous boosting between AstraZeneca followed by a Moderna vaccine. What you notice is that you do a, a chat docs to chat docs, AstraZeneca. The AstraZeneca, your antibody boosting is not very good. But if you do one dose of AstraZeneca followed by mRNA, you actually end up very good results. So this is AstraZeneca with AstraZeneca boosting. Levels are well, slightly better. But do an AstraZeneca to Moderna vaccine boosting, you see immediately that the levels are much higher. So when you move vaccines and change vaccines, it matters very much. But I want to remind the readers audience here that very often the sequence is important. If you were to flip over and you do the mRNA first followed by the AstraZeneca, you can't get the same results, which means your booster must be quite good and the mRNA Moderna is actually quite a good booster. So high levels of antibodies are produced where you use heterologous boosting versus homologous boosting. And there actually is a good accidental result. If you look at the chat docs again, which is the um, AstraZeneca boosting, the original Swedish isolate, you have some antibodies, but when you actually go into the B1351, which is a variant, which is a resistant variant, the antibody's ability to neutralize it comes down. So that isn't very, very good. But if you look at the uh, AstraZeneca followed by the Moderna, you have actually better, more efficacious in, uh, antibodies against the B1351. Remember, the B1351 wasn't swimming in Sweden, but it's a comparator. In the, in the in vitro state, you actually have better boosting. So the good side effect then is that from the original strain, you actually end up with a better antibody response as you can see here. So by mixing, not only do you have high antibody levels, but you can probably deal with the, uh, the mutant strains or potential resistance strains better. So boost, uh, heterologous boost is a bonus and it provided better protection. So what happened was not only did Canada and Germany did the heterologous boosting, Thailand did it as well. They went from Sinovac to AstraZeneca mix. South Korea did it too, AstraZeneca to Pfizer. And India, they went for AstraZeneca to Bharat. I haven't seen the data for the AstraZeneca to Bharat. Bharat, it is literally the same as Sinovac, Sinopharm, but just made by a different company from India. 
Now I'm going to share with you something called hybrid boosting. So we have homologous, which is the same, heterologous, which is a different brand, and hybrid boosting. And hybrid boosting actually means if you have been infected, and then now you get a vaccine and we see what's the response like. So it comes from this paper, uh, you can Google search it. And what happens is, um, this is it's a bit complicated. I'm going to try to take you through again. Look at two colors, the blue color, which is a COVID naive, and the red color, which are COVID recovered. So if you look at the antibodies between the anti-spike uh, anti and the anti-RBDs, the recovered ones are red. They have a high antibody initially, and it goes higher after the first shot. The blue ones are the naive ones, which means they have not been infected. And again, they have zero, they go up and they go up again. So after the first dose, uh, after the first dose, the levels go higher. And with the second dose, the recovered ones don't do any better. That is your data. If you have recovered from COVID, all you need is actually one shot. But if you are naive, when you go for your second shot, your level goes higher. But the levels are not high enough as compared to those who have recovered with a boost. So recovered individuals, you just need only one dose. The second dose doesn't help very much. And the naive individuals, two doses are still not good enough. Those who have infected plus the boosting, they have the best response. Now, this is a more recent paper which talk about these um, uh, hybrid boosting. And we're going to take it a different level and you're going to see it down here. If you are infected, uh, you end up with the gray, oops, sorry. Um, if you're infected, look at the columns on your graph on your left. These are random convalescent. They're actually not very effective in actually doing all the different kinds of infections there are. But if you get infected and vaccinated, you end up with good antibody levels. In fact, possibly dealing with other variants as well, uh, including uh, variants which have not been seen or the potential variants that will come along. Even SARS-CoV-1, this is SARS 2003, you have some neutralizing. So what it tells you is the best people with the best immunity is actually the hybrid people where they have infection followed by one good booster like an mRNA and you have very good response. I'm going to show it to you. Plasma for individuals who have been infected, subsequently received mRNA vaccines. They were able to neutralize uh, the high resistant um, SARS-CoV-2 polymutant spike and the diverse SARS-CoV virus spike proteins. So when you actually uh, if actually someone has been infected, you end up with very, very good results. Okay, I'm coming to the end of the slides. I'm going to show you some individuals what happens when you have an inactivated vaccine as a booster. You can see that the serology before and after, you have this. And this is where I like CPAS, where you actually show the quality before 91 and the quality after. How much of it actually blocks the receptor binding? So with four individuals, this is hardly representative of anything. These are young individuals who are less than 60 years old without comorbidities. They actually have a good uh, CPAS response, a good serology response after post-inactivated vaccine. This is another data with uh, about 20 to 30 different people looking at their CPAS results after three doses of inactivated vaccines. So they would have had two followed by one more as a booster. So in this group of people, uh, the, you do have some immune response and actually quite a fair number of them actually have 90 to 100% on CPAS. That's quite good. But we do have individuals who are suboptimal at less than 90. In fact, we have a couple here where only 20 to 30% CPAS. So that's one lies one of the problems with the inactivated vaccines. You don't have consistently good results for the CPAS blockage. And I want to stress to you again, this is very skewed data. These are less than 60 years old. And the robust, uh, the robust data in terms of the vaccine boosting is still with the mRNA. And this is something the Ministry of Health wants me to show you that in, the, in Turkey, they signed that three doses is actually quite good. But at the end of the day, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, when you use as a third dose of vaccination, is superior in protection 
compared to the coronavirus vaccine. So if you have individuals who have had two inactivated vaccine, consider getting a Pfizer BioNTech as a booster. Uh, you would actually have very, very good response. Okay, this is my last slide here. It's just a summary, neutralizing antibodies. I like the test because it tells me exactly how much blocking am I doing. It's the blocking antibodies I'm measuring how good it is. I like the fact that we are boosting with the third dose now. We can actually reduce mortality and hospitalization. We can certainly cut down a lot of serious illnesses. It cuts down the burden on the healthcare system. If you know someone's been infected before, get the person an mRNA vaccine because this is hybrid boosting is very, very good. Heterologous boosting so far turns out to be good and you may have some bonus features. You might be able to uh, deal with other variants as well. And of course, the sequence of boosting matters. If you change the sequence, your antibody response is different. Okay, uh, Yifeng, I'm going to pass this time back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Liam, for this very inspiring talk, as always. Many audience have already asked a lot of burning questions on the chat box. So we'll wait until the end Q&A session to address, okay? So let's welcome Prof. Wang Fa, a visionary scientist and inventor of the CFAS technology. Prof. One is a professor from Program in Emerging Infectious Diseases at Duke NUS Medical School. Prof. One is a member of multiple WHO committees. His work has been recognized globally through various of international awards, numerous invited speech at major international conferences, and more than 400 scientific papers. With three decades research in virology, Prof. One has been successful in developing assays which can better assess vaccine efficacy. His team has also brought hope to end the pandemic with past the battle virus neutralizing antibody and vaccine strategies. Prof. One will speak about CPAS technology, individual differences in neutralizing longevity and post-infection or vaccination, boosting vaccine strategies, you know, with, uh, including quali quantitative or qualitative boosting, how CPAS can serve as a tool to manage COVID-19 pandemic. Prof, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So I try to get my slides. Can you see my slides? Not slides yet. okay? Not yet. Ah. So I was can asked to. Yeah, okay. Now I can share the screen and you can see now. Good. All right. So yeah, thanks. Slides. You still cannot see the slides. Okay. Can you see the slides now? No? Oh, just a minute. Huh? I push it to you already. Let me just push it to you again. Yeah. Then I accept it. Yeah, I say show now, my yeah. I say show my screen. I accept it. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you see? Uh, we are still waiting to see your screen. Really? Show the screen. That's interesting. We test their work, right? Yes. Right. <laughs> Still no? Uh, no. Uh, let me just push to you. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can see it now. I can see now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you see now? Slide yeah, your mode. On. Is it moving? Yeah, yes. moving. Very good. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, sorry about the tech. Uh, we tried it before, and uh, maybe Dr. Liang, you just give a, a too good talk, and the, the system just thinking my talk is redundant, you know. So, anyway, so it's always uh, hard to follow Dr. Liang. You know, he's a knowledgeable and very excellent communicator. You know, so I'm a scientist. I'm not a doctor, so uh, I have to talk a bit more about the scientific aspects, and uh, so. Uh, it's a 20 minutes talk, but I would cover it because every time I don't know the audience whether you know it's new, somebody maybe you know just new to this. So I will do very quickly you know on the basics on the immunity protection and then niche on the body, C pass and so on. But the the last three I think it might be the more interesting one. Right? It's overlap a little bit uh, with Dr. Liang, but have a different angle. And uh, so immunity, you know, it's a very very complex, right? It's only you know in multicellular organisms we have it, you know, so humans, animals, you know, and uh, 
for the adaptive immunity arm, you know, you, you hear a lot from the uh, media and the scientific literature, people always argue about which one is more important. Is that a cell media immunity or the humoral immunity? And we have the antibodies and then we have a neutralized antibody. So my view is very clear, you know, I mean, the evolution uh, uh, developed these two systems, obviously both are important, right? Both, uh, but really the subtle difference is whether you're talking about prevent disease or prevent infection. In terms of prevent infection transmission, antibodies are more important because they're in the circulation. Even before the virus get into your cells, neutral antibody can block that process, whereas T cell only works when your uh, virus is already replicated in the cell. Before that, they are not activated. So protect the immunity, you know, it uh, depends on what you're talking about. Protect against what, right? The, the bare minimum, you know, if you vaccinate, you have to be at least protect against death. Then, you know, your kind of uh, uh, desire goes up. Say, I wa also want to, uh, to protect against severe disease or any disease, right? It would be a good vaccine. Then to say, for myself, the top three is good enough, but for the society, because we still have 15% uh, in the naive population in the society for Singapore and in the world, 50% are still not vaccinated. So it will be good for the society if it also protect against transmission. And then infection. So infection is the, the, the most difficult. Basically, after vaccination, if the virus is exposed to your nose, can they still replicate and infect you, you know, and then followed by that transmission disease in the death. Okay, so we all know that no matter which vaccine you take, inactive vaccine, you know, adenovirus or mRNA, they are all pretty good against the top two. So these are the bare minimum, right? So uh, protect against death and severe disease, unless you have a predisposed, you know, uh, 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 conditions. But in terms of protection against the dis mild disease transmission infection, I have to say, you know, uh, uh, it's good, but not as good as we originally thought for two reasons. One is that immunity wanes faster. Whether it, even for mRNA vaccine now, we found that five to six months later, it dropped very rapidly. And secondly, is the virus are mutating. So we have the variant, especially the Delta now. So the combination of when immunity and the introduction of Delta really made the last three, you know, the uh, protect against mild disease transmission and infection very difficult. <clears throat> Core risk of protection, it's a, you know, a, a historical challenge. And uh, anciently, we use a visual observation, we use antigen-specific antibodies, and we use clinic trials, we use animal studies. All of these are really try to define uh, a core risk of protection. And for COVID-19, we have to say that it's not perfect, but more and more now, at least that uh, people agree that neutral antibody is one of the better COVID protections against infection at least, right? And the other thing, as I said, you know, uh, T cells are important in terms of protection against the disease and the death, but also on the practical level, we now can measure neutral antibody on large scale, very rapid and run automated. We still could not do that with uh, 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 T cells. So neutral antibody levels are highly predictive of immune protection. So there are many, many papers. A milestone paper is in that nature medicine. So traditionally, to measure neutral antibodies, you need to use live virus. And for COVID-19, unfortunately, it's a BSS-3 agent. So there's only a few labs you know, can do in Singapore. And in developing nations, they just don't have such a capability. The other challenge, of course, you know, it's tedious, expensive, and it's very, very hard to reproduce because you have live cell, live uh, 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 virus, different operators, and uh, quality assurance is a nightmare. So up to this date, FDA or HS in Singapore has never approved a neutralization test for any virus, not only for COVID-19. So in that regard, you know, we were fortunate because you know, very early on last year, I came up with this idea of a surrogate virus neutralization. The concept is very simple. Instead of uh, mix the live virus with antibody, now we mix a protein engineer, the HRP, the receptor binding domain conjugate with the uh, 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 test serum and then the AC2, Dr. Yang already uh, talked about the receptor on the same surface of our body, 
we engineer become soluble protein so we can put onto ELISA plant. So uh, three, five days, you know, live versus neutralization in BSS3 become a one hour, 30 minutes kind of a assay and it's the highly reproducible. And for that reason, you know, we were able to launch the product in 70 days and we got an FDA approval as the first neutralization test. If you want to claim a surrogate for human use, you have to demonstrate it's as good as the real thing. The real thing is live virus production, uh, a flat reduction neutralization test of PINT. As you can say, see it, you know, the, the concordance is uh, R squared equal to 0 0.95. This is as good as you can get for any biological system, basically. And then, you know, so in the same Nature Medicine paper that I show, this is a very, very cited diagram. So in the middle in blue is basically your convalescent. So the Neutron antibody is defined as a unit to one. So these are people recovered from COVID-19. And on the y-axis is the level of protection they offer. And then, so we already know, you know, mRNA uh, vaccine gave you the best. It's about four-fold higher than the convalescent. And then you come down to inactive vaccines around four-fold lower. But they still, you know, offers protection, you know, against uh, uh, disease very well. So this is really try to show two things. One is that uh, you know, very early on the Hong Kong group using our CPAS test to compare the Coronavac, the Sandovac, and the uh, uh, Pfizer mRNA. So after dose one, as you can see, the Sandovac is basically, our cutoff is 30%, so it's at 15 to 16%. After those two, average goes to 66%. And then for the Pfizer, after those one, you know, it's uh, 66%. And uh, uh, after those two, now goes to around 94%. So two important messages. One is that, uh, you know, obviously mRNA is better than the inactivate. Secondly, is two doses of Sandovac have similar neutral antibody against, uh, you know, for one dose of mRNA. So this is just a, a graphic uh, a diagram. I was analyzing our own data, you know, it's a small scale data that, uh, you know, only from our lab data. And uh, so, so this is uh, Pfizer, you know, a uh, uh, pri uh, prime boost. And then uh, uh, 90 days later, they start to drop a little bit, Madonna, and then Sanovac, followed by Sanovac. I was really amazed is that, uh, these are two different, you know, uh, uh, study cohort, one in Hong Kong, one in Singapore, totally different, you know, operators. The only thing in common <clears throat> is the same vaccine and same test, the commercial CPAS. Look at the concordance. So after one dose of Sinovac, right? So in our uh, group, we got a 16%, Hong Kong is 15.6, and two doses, we are 66 and they're 66.7. I mean, this data is just too good to believe. And then Pfizer, one dose, we're 63, they're 66, and then 96, uh, they're 94.5. And then for Madonna, they did not do it for us. It's, uh, it goes, you know, to 79 and 97. So again, you know, illustrate that uh, the assay, as Dr. Liang says, is uh, really very, very specific and measure the true functionality and it's very, very reliable. You know, these are two different studies from two different nation, uh, uh, regions, basically. So booster vaccine, Dr. Liang went in much more detail than I do. I just try to make a few general statements. All vaccines in current use have a neutral antibody boost infected when used appropriate. Even if you, as the Dr. Liang showed, you use the inactive vaccine, you can still get a boosting effect. But the boost effect is greater when the post-vaccination neutral antibody level is lower, okay? Because it makes sense, right? If your neutral antibody is already high, you will not get a, a massive boosting. And then one thing that Dr. Liang did not touch is the optimum boosting, the time lag between the last vaccination and the, the booster vaccination. And we have some data to say, you know, you need to wait at least for five to six months to get a maximum impact. And then, Dr. Lea already says that hydrox boosting seems to have a better effect than the homolog boosting. So I don't want to show the data unpublished. I just want to show you some of the, you know, uh, 
uh, data. That, so this is the one that Dr. Liang says that uh, don't have a data. So we have some cohort that we uh, collaborate. It's a sum of that times two. They did not wait for five months. They went ahead three months because these were healthcare workers in the front line. They decided to put an AstraZeneca. Very good, Dr. Liang. So the average, you know, after three months, the Sinovac cohort only have a CPAR 35%. And when they got AstraZeneca, they went to 95%. So that was very impressive. And we have a very special cohort. You know, people have very uh, a strong allergic reactions are Pfizer one, Pfizer one shot, and they stopped. And then they, you know, when the Sinovac become available later, they try to take the sound of that and various times. I'm only showing you the data from six months. That's the best. So from sound of uh, Pfizer, you know, got one shot. You know, we already show you, right? Sign the uh, Pfizer one shot average is 66%. But in this cohort, six months later, they dropped to below 30, 15% average. One shot of sound of that bring them to 75. So this is what I'm saying, right? All boosting vaccines in current use has an impact depends who you use, when you use, and what's their base level. If their base level is low, they really go up. And then, you know, anecdotally, we have somebody, you know, uh, 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 also really went rapidly after two doses Pfizer, around seven months later, dropped to 35, one shot of Moderna, bring them to saturation level of 97. So these are very anecdotal, you know. So Dr. Liang has shown that, you know, a very comprehensive study. This is a US NIH study. It's not published yet, it's in preprint. So these are the three vaccines, you know, J&J, uh, &J, Moderna, and the Pfizer, and uh, in different, uh, you know, uh, boosting. So J&J &J followed by Moderna, followed by Pfizer, followed by Johnson & Johnson, J&J. Uh, 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 &J. So as you can see, the fold of increase after booster is 76, 35, and the full fold. So, J and J boost by itself is very minimal. So, but what they did is a ranking, which I think you know we have to take this with a, a you know a, a, a little bit caution, because these are what they imagine is the absolutely neutral antibody level after the boosting, without taking into consideration of the time span and also the fold of boosting. So they had nine combinations, right? You have three vaccines, three times three, you have nine combinations. So Madonna and Madonna rank number one, five and Madonna number two, and so on. And then J and J and J and J itself is the, the worst. So these are measured by absolute neutral antibody level after the booster shot. But again, without taking into consideration of the baseline neutral antibody and the interval between the first vaccination and the booster vaccination. Okay, so now I'm going to touch a little bit of dealing with neutral antibody on the variants of concerns, right? As I said, we invented this, you know, very clever idea to do the CPAS. CPAS stands for COVID pass, and uh, obviously we're based on the original parental, uh, the Wuhan strand. So now we have, you know, various uh, variants, including the Delta. So what we did is uh, produce exactly same assay. The only thing you have to change is that blue part, the receptor binding domain. And the receptor binding domain, the sequence of the Wuhan strain and the delta only vary by two amino acid residue. So through protein engineering, you purify, make a new protein, and now you have a C pass for the VOC delta, and we call it D pass for, for just simplicity. So this is a single plaque, right? So you do one C pass, one D pass, on the zero that we know this, uh, people have a primary infection with the Delta variant, okay? So you have some good news and bad news. Good news is that we can actually differentiate. If you send me unknown zero to say that person has been infected, and we can tell whether it's a Delta or Beta by doing this, uh, you know, a, a, a comparative uh, C pass versus D pass. The bad news is that when the antibody is at very high level, as you can see here, the, this is the titration out, right? The difference may not be sufficient to, to, to uh, 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 differentiate. Okay, so now I'm gonna move to, you know, beyond what we are dealing with, you know, the current kind of vaccine booster, C pass, D pass, is to look into the future. Uh, Dr. Liang already mentioned the concept of the Cybeco virus. So this is the coronavirus family tree. 
SARS-1 is here, MERS is here, and the SARS-2 is here. So we have four genera of four groups of coronavirus. Alpha and beta can cause, uh, can cause infection and disease, mild disease in human for alpha, severe disease for beta. And the zoonotic viruses like the, the SARS-1, 2, and the MERS are all in beta. And then we have a subgenus called the Sarbeco virus. Basically, it's a SARS-like beta coronavirus. And these are the ones the most dangerous because as they already uh, 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 indicate by SARS-1 and SARS-2, they are more transmissible and they use our human ACE2 as a receptor. Okay, so I always say, you know, uh, it's too early to worry about SARS-3, but for scientists like myself, we should do that now. You know, we should get ready for SARS-3 because SARS-3 most likely will be another cervical viruses. And unfortunately, where we live is the hotspot. Okay, so for that reason, we made an improvement of this surrogate virus initialization or CPAS. So as I showed you previously, you know, the CPAS assay, we have the receptor on the solid phase on the ELISA plate. So now for this multiplex, we can do is we reverse the liquid solid phase. We put IBD on the magnetic beads of the Luminex system, and the receptor, the AC2 now is the liquid form, and we coat the IBD using biotinylation in a very uniform form. So now we do assays in one tube. All these neutralizing, five different neutralization tests in one tube and one kind of vessel, and it's automated. All we need is a five mark liter of uh, a serum, and we can detect their bindings, not only against the SARS-CoV-2 variants, and now you can go all the way against the different cervical viruses, so SARS-2 on top and the SARS-1 at the bottom. And uh, so this assay is very, very powerful now. So now we're demonstrating is that uh, these are the parental strands, so the original uh, 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 Wuhan strand. This is the VOC beta. This is the VOC delta. So if you run this multiplex assays and five different you know, neutralization in one, basically, right? So it looks like they're very close, but our differentiation power can tell you that the original virus gave you neutralization best against the white type, followed by alpha, delta, and the beta and the gamma is similar. If you're infected by beta, beta is the best, equal to gamma, and then followed by alpha, white type of data. Delta, then it goes the other way around. From this uh, 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 data, you can already see the difference here goes down. It's visible, but not as dramatic as this. So if you're infected by beta, you can go there. Delta, you go come down much more significant job of neutralization antibodies. So this is a very important scientific data because the vaccine we have is all against the parental Wuhan strand. We call this first generation of COVAX. There are companies like the Pfizer, you know, BioNTech, uh, 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 and uh, Moderna is already tracing this uh, variant. So initially they traced beta, tried to produce the second generation vaccine, and now they are also developing delta. So imagine now, if you are naive, okay, if you're vaccinated by beta, it's actually worse than this vaccine. The vaccine we got at least have an equal chance of uh, protect against this with some reduction as we see here. But if you're vaccinated by the beta, you actually get very worse protect as a delta. If you have a delta vaccine, then you have a worse protection against beta. So our dream is to go for a pan virus vaccine. So this is the study that we did in Singapore from the SARS survivors who have received a dose of uh, one or two doses of the Pfizer uh, vaccine. So the by definition, in Dr. Liang's def uh, definition, this is the hybrid booster. So I'm going to introduce another concept, you know, called the cross clay booster. So clay one is the SARS one, clay two is the SARS two. So imagine if you have a vaccine that targets the clay one virus and the clay two virus. If you do this kind of uh, uh, across clay boosting, you will get much, much better immunity. We call it super immunity because uh, you now are protect not only against the variants, but against SARS-1 and uh, potentially SARS-3, SARS-4. 
So I have an animation to show that at the end, but I, I first want to thank you know, my team in GPS and the, the NCID team at Colorado Law and DXD Hutkin, and then the NIBSC, which is the international standard, and James Group, of course, our commercial partner. And I do have to declare, you know, I'm the, not only the inventor of the SNNTC pass, now I have a pattern on cross uh, uh, uh antibodies and also the third generation of vaccines. So now I'm going to try to, you know, uh, start this uh, 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 animation. I don't know if the sound, okay. Can you hear the sound? Not yet, Paul. Can you see? Yes, can see. Prof, why don't you just explain? <laughs> the sound is not coming. Oh, the, there's no no sound. Okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, it's a SARS one survivor receive a BioNTech uh, vaccine, and we use the multiplex uh, SVNT. And then we're against 10 different subvector virus. The first seven is uh, clay two, and the last three is clay two. So not only human virus, but also animal virus. So this is from SARS-1, COVID-19 patient serum, vaccinated serum, COVID-19 and vaccinated, and SARS-1 and, and uh, vaccinated. So this is the best, as you can see, they get an equal neutralization against 10 different viruses, okay? Yeah, so not only VOCs, but also the pangolin and the bat viruses. Yeah. So what we are trying to see is that, you know, in future, whether we can develop a, a vaccine so that you don't have to have a SARS-1 infection. Instead, you have a clay one vaccine and a clay two vaccine, and then you will be able to protect against all the known subvector virus and also future subvector viruses. Yeah. Thank you. That's all. Thank you so much, Prof. I think everybody in the audience must be anxiously waiting for this new next generation vaccine as a booster. Yeah, we're doing yeah. our best. <laughs> All right, we have received a huge number of questions from the audience, uh, including, I guess we'll start with those um, who have sent us through emails. So Dr. Che has um, asking that, um, what level of CPAS will give protection? Um, is there any other antibodies that we can measure to know our protection? Dr. Leon, do you want to take this? No, I think Professor Wang should take this. Yeah, so uh, uh, in terms of antibodies in the context of protection, you cannot be neutralizing antibodies, right? So the neutral antibody is the, as good as you can get. Uh, the question is that, uh, CPAS, you know, measure neutral antibody block the AC to IBD. So some people said there's also neutral antibody against N terminals. And I said, yes, but uh, can you have an assay to measure all the neutral antibody as easy as the, our assay? The other thing is that the N terminal neutralizing uh, impact, the S2 neutral impact is going to be less than 5% of total neutral antibody because the, the main target is IBD. The question of, you know, what's the level you need to get a, a, a protection? And I always have to say that uh, you can only do that at the population level, right? At the individual level, because your other conditions were influenced. At the population level, there are many studies doing correlation of protection using neutral antibody. So basically, mostly are healthcare workers. So hospital in Israel, hospital in Vietnam, hospital in UK, they have done this already. So uh, for the original virus in alpha, so these are the ones that the uh, vaccine protects the most. Looks like a 60% CPAS is a threshold. 
Below that, at the population level, you have a risk. Above that, then you have protection. And above 80%, then you know you have 95% confidence you will be protected at the population level. And then the Vietnamese studies is in the Ho Chi Minh uh, hospital that the unfortunately they were hit by Delta. So similar studies using CPAS, they demonstrated that the threshold is around 70%. So 70% CPAS at the population level, that below that you have a risk above, then you know uh, uh, you have less uh, uh, risk. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Um, the second question is actually, you know, uh, more of a statement. Why are they still arguing about neutralizing antibodies as a good correlate of protection? Um, so basically, that's a week ago on the 21st of October. Uh, in the Journal of the America Medical Association, there is a report yeah. about the flawed science of antibody testing for SARS-CoV-2 immunity. Uh, what's your opinion about this report? Okay, you, want you, want to to start first. you want me to I'll start? Let, let Paul start, then I'll... Yeah, yeah. So, so to me, is the, this, is the, this is the nature of COVID-19, right? Not only social media, but the scientific community also is expressing uh, a very strong views. And I, I was really interested to see that commentary was by a single author. Usually, if you want to make such a strong statement, you need the, like the, all the experts to, to agree, right? Consensus. So this is not a consensus. What I think is actually uh, in, in the commentary, actually they list the CPAS as a more reliable test, you know, so that was good. So basically that I'm not arguing against the sentiment to say you cannot use neutral antibody at the individual level to say you will not be infected. But I said medicine, you know, medicine, nothing is 100%. Medicine is about statistic. Medicine is about a call from the population. So at the population level, I think that there's no argument. If you have high neutral antibody level, you have less chance of infection and transmission. So I don't think I need to argue more than that to, to say that uh, it's just the opinion piece to say that antibody tests alone at the individual level is not going to be good enough to predict whether you'll be infected or not. And I agree with that. I'm going to add on that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Prof Fang. And it is very, very myopic to just say that, oh, once I cross 80% or 79% or 82.1%, I'll be protected. I can go out there and filter all the air, breathe in, I'll be a better than a HEPA filter in clearing out the COVID 19. No. Okay, so in terms of the protection, it is actually a very response. And then, as what Prof. Wang said, there is a difference between individuals, a diabetic, poorly controlled versus a healthy individual, same age with the same vaccines and the same correlation, the response is different. And you must not underestimate that there's also the T cell component the immune system that's yes. very, very important. And so um, one of the questions later will be, should, why isn't MOH doing this? Yes, I would like MOH to do this so that we'll know from the population point of view how many percentage of them are doing it. Now, for yourself, if you do it, that's good. You can you kind of estimate for yourself how good you are in terms of prevention. But it is not the single and it's not the one thing. It's yeah. not like the PSLE result or the O-level results or the A-level results. You make the grade, you'll be fine. It will just give you a hint as to how likely you're going to fall sick. That's the bottom line. It's good to know, but it doesn't mean you won't fall sick or you will fall sick if you meet or you do not meet the number. Yeah, maybe I'll just add one more thing is, uh, which is uh, kind of uh, difficult as uh, Dr. Leon says, if you have a, what we are measuring is a serum neutralizing antibody, right? So our test, you know, CPAS is great. We can even do finger prick very easy, but it's still a zero neutral antibody. So Dr. Liang mentioned the T cell immunity that we cannot measure, nobody can measure large scale right now. The other thing is that a zero neutral antibody in, in circulation versus your mucosal antibody, if there's a mismatch, then that's where somebody has high level of zero neutral antibody still get infection. Okay, so this is uh, one of the area I have been thinking a lot. Can we adapt CPAS to measure IgA in your mucosal surface, you know? Uh, we have tried, it's not easy, but uh, we will still work toward that goal, yeah. Thank you. Thank you both, Prof and uh, Dr. Leon.
So the next question is actually from Dr. Lee uh, Siu Kin. InnoQuest offers the test uh, CNA, which is CPAS SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibody, as well as COQ, uh, which is the anti-S quantitative total antibody assay. What is the advantage of one test over the other? How will we actually position these two tests as in which and when the doctor should order? Uh, Dr. Leong, would you like to take this question? If I can only afford one test, it will be the CPAS test. If the person says I, I money is no issue, I would actually like to have a look at both tests. I like the, the C pass as well as the S to look at the quantification as well. So um, each of them measures something differently. Uh, one is the total antibodies, which you talked about against the spike proteins, here's the spike protein or the antibodies, the others. But if you only want to have one test, one test to rule them all and to interpret them all, it will be the C pass because that tells you how much binding there's blocking. Coming back, yeah. I would like yeah. to have huge quantities and huge quality. So if I can afford it, I'll do both tests. Yes, yeah, so the only thing I can add is very, very rare in, in our experience that you can have a low uh, a C pass rating and a high uh, anti S. So what that means is the vaccine. So that's some people worry to say if I have a low C pass, does that mean the vaccine? This means the vaccine totally failed or the quality of immune response is not good enough. So that's as Dr. Leon says, if you have the money you can afford, do both, because if both are high, you're happy. If one is low, for example, you know, your neutral antibody is low, but your anti-S is high, it means the vaccine works in your body. Unfortunately, your immune system recognizes the wrong epitope, you know. So then, even I cannot tell, you know, whether you do another booster, because your anti-S is already high, but your c pass is low, you know. Very, very rare, but we have seen somebody like that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, the next question is, um, so uh, Prof. One, I think um, you have written some lines about cross-boosting between Sinovac and also MRA. Uh, yeah. Would you mind sharing some insights on what happens after two doses of Sinovac and then followed by a booster of MRA vaccine? Oh yeah, so if you have a, a Sinovac, you know, uh, even for about AstraZeneca, I have demonstrated that goes really high, you know. So, so if you have two doses of Sinovac, and if you're, you know, again, individually, right, your immune system, if you have a low immune response by Sinovac, is due to the vaccine, then boost with mRNA, Madonna will push you up. But if it's a low because your immune system is not good, then you know, you will not get as high. So definitely uh, it will push you to the 95 level. And we have demonstrated even with two doses of uh, Sinovac followed by one dose of AstraZeneca can go to 95. So if you do uh, a Moderna, definitely will be 95 uh, uh, average, yeah. I'm going to supplement by saying that Prof. Wen mentioned something. I'm going to just emphasize it again. The duration between the second dose yeah. and the booster dose, yeah. the longer yeah. you stretch it, the better yeah. efficacy. The sweet yeah. spot is anything between five to six months. Yeah. And the yeah. easiest way to remember is your hepatitis B vaccine is 016. At the six months, some, it's just a sweet spot for the immune yeah. to be remembered. Uh, it's yeah. like a, a good time to do the revision. Five to six yeah. months, the sweetest spot. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Leon. And this actually uh, is very close to another question that uh, many doctors are asking. So some individuals who are actually fully vaccinated, but they still get infected, right? Then yeah. after their recovery, um, will we still suggest them to go to another booster? If so, how long? Uh, <laughs> <definitely after. laughs> I'll do this. Okay. So you must look at it from another level. If you look at immunity in terms of response, after your first dose, your immune response is just like this, going up like this. But with your second dose, your immune response is like this, going up this. But your third dose, after your booster dose, your immune response will go up like this, such that hopefully by the day four or five, after your third, bo after your third dose, you will actually have enough immune response to cope with it. So if you look at the person who's been vaccinated twice, followed by an infection, you're actually going to end up with a peak that's very, very fast. The science currently does not support another dose thereafter. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's great, isn't it? Let's take another shot. 
then I can be covered. In fact, we talked about it. If you have natural infection, then you get a vaccine. Perhaps I can have the pan Sabino virus immunity, but the science does not support it at this point in time. If you do take it, there's no harm. But are you wasting a shot when somebody else needs it? Or are you going through, uh, is, is, it, is it necessary? The answer is, at this point, we have no idea. We're not too sure. My only thing is, watch this space. Okay, Janscript, we can give another talk and then we can talk about this again when we have the data. Yeah, so we, we, are, we are following that data. Uh, so National MOH has a, a, a cohort doing that. Personally, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Leon. Uh, in principle, there's no need for a third shot after two shots in a vaccine breakthrough infection. But if your uh, yourself or your patient is really worried about, you know, take a neutral antibody reading because if it's 95%, then it's not only waste the dose because uh, vaccines are safe, but uh, vaccines still have side effects. Even if we're not admitting, why you risk, you know? So that's my view here. Thank you, thank you so much. So I guess it's going um, to be the last question for this session. Um, doctors are asking how long um, does CPAS antibody level actually can you know suggest after a single CPAS test? Are we recommending individuals to take another CPAS test because antibody may drop over time? Uh, what what is the you know what Dr. Liang will have to say? Okay, look at Professor Wang Linfa's work. Okay, Professor Wang Linfa actually looked at the nat natural immunity of individuals who had COVID-19. About 30% of them have a pretty long lasting levels. And what we understand is after natural infection, 30% uh, will last and then for vaccinated, they kind of follow something very similar. So certainly in my practice as well, I've seen people who had uh, the vaccine where levels fall very rapidly and I've just spoken to a lady colleague, my classmate, whose levels remain at 94 <laughs> since for the last six months, nine months. That's envy. Okay, so mm -hmm. varies between different people. Some will fall, some won't fall. Now, then what the idea of the day is, what is my clinical decision? If I've decided I have two shots, the data is that by getting a boost shot, booster shot, I can lower down infections, lower down hospitalization. I've decided I'm going to go for the booster, then forget it. Don't do the test, just go for the booster shot. After the booster shot, you can check your levels, then you know what you are at your peak. If you are very interested, you can monitor three months, six months for your own curiosity what it is. The downside is that it's a bit of a pain in the wallet. You have to pay for the test. Okay, that's the practical aspect of it. But if money is no object and you want to monitor it, by all means, we stand on the weighing scale every few days or every few months. And for me, never, because it only goes one direction up. So I don't look at my weighing scale. I'm happy with it. I'm happy with my food. I'm happy with my immunity. So be it. And hopefully we can help you because we are doing that at the national level so that just like we monitored the uh, uh, COVID-19 survivors, we monitor for nine months and we say if you're 90%, how long does it take on average? But again, this is medicine, okay? This is on average. For individual, it could be, you know, uh, you could be outlier, but hopefully we will have the data, you know, we will publish that at the national level, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I think we have received multiple copies of this question and I would like to also address this one uh, during, you know, this talk. Uh, so many doctors are actually offering also serology testing to uh, for people who are going back to China. Um, the China actually requires the S testing or N testing for entry of China, uh, you know, for China visa or an entry to show that these individuals are probably, you know, naive to COVID-19 disease. What are the differences between this test versus CPAS? But that I policy is is, uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I, I have to go, so maybe I answer this first. I'm uh, uh, there. All right. Uh, yeah. Good and the meeting. They are contradictory because uh, on one hand they want you have to do N and uh, S test. On the other hand, they want you to do the inactive vaccine uh, to get a visa. So if you do inactive vaccine, you get an antibody reading. So that's uh, 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 you cannot differentiate between infection and the vaccination. So we actually have the data, you know. Uh, uh, by a son of a vaccination, you get an antibody. So, 
Sorry, I have to move the plan. You, you, you take the question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So very quickly, yeah. uh, yeah. I'm just yeah. going to go. On. NTS is against the spike protein. NTN is against the nucleoside, but, uh, and uh, the protein. So and. If you had the mRNA, your NTS would be positive. If you had an inactivated vaccine, your NTS would be positive. If you had an inactivated vaccine, then your NTN would be positive. But if you had the mRNA vaccine, your NTN would be negative. Unfortunately, I'm going to disagree with the Chinese ministry with coming up with this pattern because the only world, only place in the world that demands you to have this test is China. In fact, when you're positive for your NTN, if you had a Nissan infection, it would have been 10 to 14 days, which means you are no longer infectious. So uh, unfortunately, it doesn't help. I don't think it is um, it's helpful, but this is what it is. Government wants to do it that way. Well, you want to enter China, you just have to play along with them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leon. I hope that will be clear to the doctors who have asked this question. Um, I didn't we're already five minutes you know, over two, and uh, it has been a long list of questions that we are not able to address in this uh, session. We'll actually ask uh, Dr. Leon after this, and then we'll send you back the uh, email uh, on, on, the on, on the reply. Thank you, Dr. Leon, again for this wonderful speech, and uh, we hope that, as you said, we will have a next session soon. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.